made a decision that was so bad that made you sick to your stomach, like you really, really messed up and you feel guilty because you made a mistake, there have been a lot of things in my life that I have done, uh, unfortunately, that have given me that kind of like gut-wrenching feeling. And that's true of our entire life. Whether you're a kid that's disappointing your parents or letting someone down, or you're a college person who's paid all of this money for school and you end up getting a failing grade and so you got to take it over again, or maybe you move into adulthood and you get married and you disappoint your spouse or your kids and the people around you. Maybe there's been a time at your job where you really drop the ball and you messed up. I was reading an article about a really popular minister who was terrible at administration, really great people person, uh, Bob Russell. And he was saying uh, one time he was scheduled to perform a wedding and he completely forgot about it. And he took his kids out to a ball game and he came back and it was two o'clock. The wedding was at 1.30 and his wife was like, honey, you were supposed to be at this wedding and he was sick to his stomach. I mean, made a huge mistake, right? You ever make something like that, a big mistake? Well, here's the deal. Guilt says I made a mistake. Shame says I am a mistake. And that's the difference. And there are a lot of people in our culture, maybe even in this room today, that feel like their life is just one big mistake. You can't get it right, you can't make it work, and you have all of these things that you do wrong, but when you look at yourself, you say, I am wrong. We're going to look at a man this morning who is walking a life full of shame. He is full of shame, and there are people all around us that live just like this man. And so if you'll read along with me in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, that's where we're going to be. It says, when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Now, a little bit of background here. Jesus had just preached one of the greatest messages ever to be preached called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And he's going to put what he preached into practice. And so Jesus is teaching, this is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. And he preached an amazing sermon. And he comes down and he says, now let me illustrate to you the kind of people God's going to be concerned about. Let me show you what the kingdom is all about. And so he comes down from the mountain after preaching this message. And it says in verse 2, a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. You see, this man is filled up with shame. And in order to understand where this man is at, we've got to put a little bit of background, a little bit of context to this passage of Scripture. For instance, there are a lot of people in our culture that are filled up with shame. People are filled up with shame because they don't have a lot of money. They're poor. People are filled up with shame because they have a really bad sexual history. They've been sexually abused, maybe as a child. Maybe they've made a lot of bad sexual mistakes by hooking up with a bunch of different people that's not their husband or their wife. Maybe they're filled up with shame because they've cheated on their spouse. A lot of guys I know are filled up with shame because they're addicted to pornography. I mean, there are a lot of people in our culture that are shamed and full of shame because of the sexual decisions that they've made. People are full of shame because of secret sins. And you walk around with this huge guilty feeling and this sense of shame because everyone else thinks that you're one thing, but really behind the scenes, you're living a completely different life. And so you're full of shame. People are full of shame because of their social status. They don't seem to fit in. They don't seem to be liked by anybody. They're just different. And they feel so ashamed for being different. And then people are ashamed because of how they look. People are ashamed because of how they look. I remember some of these insecurities that followed me from the time that I was very little. I'm, I, I, I'm like a little chubby right now, okay? Okay, I get it. It's not a big deal. I love donuts. Okay, we shared that last week. But here's the deal. When I was a little kid, I mean, I was, I was kind of a, a chunky dude. I played football. I was on the defensive line. And then kind of once I got into high school, I started to drop some of my weight. But I had always carried this deep insecurity about how I looked to other people. And so I would do different times. And this is really embarrassing, okay? So this is me being just totally real. One time, I would do different things to kind of like hide my insecurities. Well, of course, I would break out and pimples all over my face. And it was just awful. And I would develop this red dot, this pimple right in the middle of my forehead, 
okay? It looked like I was from somebody from the Asian Eastern Islands and that I, you know, I was a Hindu or a, a Buddhist or whatever. Put a little dot right there on my forehead. So I decided to put makeup on my face as a dude to cover up my, my pimples. I was so ashamed of what I looked like. And that's the thing, shame, tell, shame causes us to do some stuff that's really, really stupid, doesn't it? Have you ever done something that's really dumb because you're just so deeply ashamed? Now, I would tell you some stories about myself as an adult, but I'm really ashamed of that, so I'm not going to share it with you. <laughs> but the ultimate idea is simply this. A leper was the scum of the earth. Think about somebody that you would not want to spend a few seconds with. The scum of the earth, totally disgusting. That's what this leper and the kind of life that he had lived. And so shame simply says, I am the mistake. And that's exactly how this guy feels. Now leprosy, the word leprosy, or leper simply means to be scaled or to have scaly skin. It's a skin disease that they probably picked up and they carried with them when they left Egypt. And so it would break out all over your skin and you would have this tingling and this numbing sensation on the part of your body. And then sooner or later, you would actually lose total uh, sense of feeling. And here's one of the worst parts about it. Because your skin on the outside is numb, you would rub yourself raw and you would literally rub parts of your body off. It would rot, you would rub your fingers off, you would rub your ears off, you would rub your nose off, because you don't even know that they're being rubbed. And it's really, it's really a grotesque disease. And here's the worst part. And this time, it was absolutely incurable. You couldn't go to the doctor to get a skin ointment to put it on. It was incurable. I've had some stuff wrong with my skin. I went to the Dominican Republic. It's probably, man, it's been like eight or nine years ago now. And I developed what the team called the Ricky Rash. Okay, my name's Rick. You can call me Ricky. That's cool. I don't, that doesn't bother me. Not a big deal. But I got the Ricky rash, and basically I was riding on, a, uh, on this really rust bucket like m- motorcycle, and I was riding on the back, and we were just having fun, and my leg came down. I still have the scar. It touched the hot pipe, burned my skin right off. I came home. I had this, this rash that somehow started in my arms and went out all over my body from head to toe, and I was really, really embarrassed. And so I went to the emergency room, but I mean, my body was so disgusting that I didn't care what part of it you had to look at, okay? And I mean all of it, as bad as that is, I just wanted to get this thing fixed. And that's how this guy with leprosy is. He's reached breaking point. He has been so cast out and so ashamed that he has reached a breaking point. It doesn't matter what he has to do. He needs to try to find healing. He needs to rid himself, not just of the shame, but this terrible physical condition, Luke adds to this. We're reading Matthew. The Gospels are a harmony. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they write kind of the same story from a different perspective. And Luke chapter 5, verse 12, Luke adds this. This man didn't just have leprosy. He was full of leprosy. Full of leprosy. He didn't just have a little skin disease starting from his arms. We're talking probably leprosy from head to toe. He's probably missing some limbs at this point. And they were known to rub off not just their fingers and their toes, but actually like things like their feet and their hands. I mean, this stuff, this stuff is, is nasty. By all intention of the law, this man is declared unclean. And God gave Israel certain laws that they had to follow so that they wouldn't contact and spread this disease. And some of those laws were really, really harsh. We're talking the the law, that's the thing about the law. The law is black and white. There's no gray room. There's no compassion. It says A or B, right or wrong. And here's this man covered in leprosy, and he has to follow these Old Testament laws. One of the things that they would have to do, for instance, in the book of Leviticus chapter 13, it says that they had to wear torn clothes. Think about that. What if you had to come to church and you had to wear clothes that were torn and ugly and smelly and ratty? You couldn't look like a normal person. Wouldn't that make you really uncomfortable? Ladies, especially. I mean, my wife can't even go to like the pharmacy without having to put makeup on and get dressed up. I'm like, dude, throw a hat on and just go to the store. She's like, no, I can't. I look terrible. I'm like, no, you don't. She's like, that's why you could just put a hat on. I'm like, I I don't look terrible with just a hat and shorts and a t-shirt. I don't get it, but hey, you know, whatever. So I'm the one who usually runs out. I mean, but think about that. They had to wear worn clothes. They had to have their hair unkept. Ugly. That's simply as best as you can get. Unkept. They couldn't put gel in it. They couldn't iron it or wash it. I mean, the hair was just disgusting looking. It was a frazzled mess. And even worse than that, when they had to approach people, they had to cover up their face and they had to shout, this is so embarrassing, they had to shout out, unclean, unclean, 
as people came around them. You want to talk about humiliating. You want to talk about a life full of shame. Think about your deepest, darkest secret, and you have to shout that out anytime you came around anybody. Pornography, porn addict, porn addict, adulterer, adulterer, thief, liar, hater, I mean, can you imagine how embarrassing and humiliated this would be? I mean, we laugh a little bit at maybe the situation and we apply that to ourselves, but we are talking about humiliation 24-7, never get a break. Not just that, but you are ostracized from your community. No hugs, no high fives, no pats on the back. Nobody wanted to be around you. Nobody wanted to look at you. You couldn't go around your family or your friends. You couldn't go around your parents. And worse, you couldn't even go into the temple to worship God, completely isolated and cut off from everyone. If you actually read secular history, like the Talmud, for instance, which is the Jewish commentary on the scriptures, and you look at some of the things that the rabbis had to say, certain rabbis developed certain traditions. They would actually not allow themselves to come in six feet of a leper. One one rabbi bragged how he would throw stones at the lepers to keep them away from him. And one specific rabbi documents this. He says, I wouldn't even buy an egg in a market if I knew a leper was there. I mean, we are talking about real extreme harsh treatment of people who are lepers. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, said this. He says, lepers were treated like dead men. So we are talking about a cultural tradition and practice where a somebody like this man we find in the scriptures is so full of shame and and hurt that he doesn't think he is lovable at all. In fact, he's not just an unlovable, he's an untouchable. But then he hears Jesus. He hears the sermon probably, the Sermon on the Mount. He's either heard it himself or he's caught wind about this guy who speaks amazing things with, with such great authority. And look at what the text says. It says in Matthew chapter eight, verse two, there came to him a leper. Now, if you were a priest, what was the rule? Don't come near me. Because you'll make me unclean. You'll ruin my my ministry. I have to go through all this stuff, all these ceremonies, all these laws. But yet this leper comes to Jesus. It means Jesus is available and he's approachable to this guy who was unclean. He doesn't operate like everybody else. And look what he says to him. Lord, if you are willing, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Such humility. I mean, think about that. You've had a disease your entire life. You know somebody has the cure. You believe it 100%, but yet you approach them. Hey, if you're willing to do this, and I know you can, will you make me clean? Such a humble guy for his situation of being filled with shame. That's what's so beautiful about this man's faith. It's probably one of the reasons why Jesus healed this man is because he's not just acting in humility, but he's also acting in complete trust and faith. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I believe that you can do this. And there's something to be said for a person who has such deep shame and has been ostracized in every area of their life, but hears about this guy named Jesus, approaches him in complete trust and complete obedience, and says, I know this guy can heal me and make me whole. That's the kind of faith that I want to have. I want to be able to trust God to a certain degree that I don't use my secret sins or my diseases such as sin or anything else as a reason to prevent me from approaching him. And so that's what this guy does. If you are willing, I have hope in you that a better life can be attained. You can make me clean. So he's not double-minded. And that's something that we in our culture, we need to rid ourselves of. How can you honestly believe that Jesus is ever going to help you if you're constantly doubting that he will? It's just not going to happen. And so we have to get rid of this double-mindedness. we got to be like this man. You can make me clean. I believe you. The only question here is if you are willing. And often we find in scripture, people are more concerned about the glory of God and the accomplishment of his purposes rather than their own personal satisfaction. And so if you can think of it like this, here is this man who's willing to live the rest of his life as a leper if it doesn't accomplish the purposes of God. And I think that's something that we can look at throughout this passage of scripture, is that there are some people in here who have had struggles and weaknesses, just like this man or the apostle Paul, and yet God told Paul, you are are strong in your weakness because I am with you. And so maybe we need to approach our weaknesses like that 
if God doesn't heal us or get rid of them. Let God be glorified. Look what it says in verse 3. Immediately it says, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Here we see Jesus touching the untouchable. What would you do in a situation like that? Let me give you an example. Would you go to a restaurant and eat food if you knew the cook had AIDS? Would you? Would you eat food from somebody that you knew had AIDS? I mean, you're not, it's, it's a blood virus. But you think about that social taboo. We don't, we don't want to touch people like that, right? That's what we think. We don't want to be around people like that. Well, think about people that have really, 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 really bad body odor. There are some people like that. They just don't even have a sense of how they smell. Would you give that person a hug? Or would they be an untouchable? Think about people who have had children out of wedlock, for instance. And in our culture, we look at somebody like that, especially Christian culture, and immediately we're like, I don't want to be associated with somebody like that because they have such a poor sexual history. I don't want to be associated with that. Are they an untouchable? I don't know who's an untouchable to you, but I want you to think about in your mind that person that you don't want to be around, you don't want to associate with, you wouldn't give a hug to, and that's your untouchable. What is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to act upon? Who are the untouchables that God is calling you to show compassion to? You see, God is for the rest of us, and sometimes that's a really hard pill to swallow because we like to think God is for everybody that's just like us. And so Jesus reaches out his hand, and he touches him, and he loves him. In the midst of this man having no life, who had to leave his family, beg for food, leave his friends, could never even hold hands in a prayer circle, and yet he comes to Jesus in hope of healing. Jesus says, I am willing. Why didn't he just do it? I mean, Jesus is God in the flesh, right? Why did he have to say, I am willing, be cleansed? Why didn't he just lay hands on him, you know, let him be cleansed and and just get on with his life? A few weeks ago, a few months ago actually, we talked about this woman who had a bleeding problem and she snuck in the crowd. Anybody that she touched would be unclean. She snuck through the the crowd. She grabbed a hold of Jesus' cloak. Jesus felt the power go from from him and she was healed. Why didn't he do something like that? Why did he verbalize, be cleansed? Well, here's the reason why I think. I think Jesus is not only concerned about this guy's uh, circumstance, but he's also concerned about his condition. He wants to heal not just his physical body, but he wants to verbalize, I am for you. I am willing to do this. God wants to bring healing to this man. And sometimes we believe the lie of Satan or the lie of the people around us that think that we are too far gone for God to love somebody or be for somebody like us, when that simply isn't true. If Jesus is for somebody like a leper, Jesus certainly is for somebody like you and like me. And so Jesus is for this man, and immediately, it says, his leprosy was cleansed. I mean, we're talking about something supernatural that took place through a divine miracle. Skin healed, body parts regrown, whatever was lost was repaid back. It's incredible. Only Jesus could do something like this. And so Jesus wasn't just interested in healing his condition. Jesus was also interested in healing his circumstance. And notice what he says in verse 4. See that you tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now why did Jesus tell him, don't tell anyone? Why would he say something like that? I mean, isn't Jesus on the scene? Didn't he just preach a really big message? Isn't he ready for everyone to know that he's the Messiah? Well, there's a few reasons, I think, why Jesus wanted him to tell no one. First of all, he was very sensitive to the cultural context of what had happened in Galilee and Judea. Jesus wasn't the first guy to come on the scene to claim to be the Messiah. There had been multiple people, and you can read about this in history, there had been multiple people leading up to this time who claimed to be the Messiah. They'd have a Jewish revolt. The Romans would come in and and kill anyone that they had to, push that revolt back down. And so Jesus is going to be really sensitive to that point. But more importantly, Jesus wanted the time to teach what the kingdom of God was going to be like. And so here he heals this leper. It's probably not really in the midst of the the large crowd. And he wants time to show people This is what God is like. This is the kind of person that God is after. His ministry, in other words, is about giving God the glory and giving people another chance with God, and he doesn't want anything to come between that. But there's another reason that we're going to get to. Look what it says, uh, continuing on in verse 4. He says, I want you to go show yourself to the priest 
And I want you to present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So don't tell anybody. Go let what happened to you be the testimony. So he would have to go through an eight-day ritual in order for him to be declared legally clean, to be accepted back into society, to be able to come back and worship God again. So he wants this man to go to the priest, to to go through these ceremonies, present the necessary sacrifices, and let that be a testimony to them. It shows us something very, very important, that you can still follow the word of God and show compassion to the people around us that need it, that might not deserve it. You can still be a person that follows the commandments of Jesus and yet still show compassion to people who are filled with shame. The two are not in contradicting terms. Just because somebody has made a bunch of bad mistakes and is filled with shame doesn't mean you can't still be a Christian and loving them. You can be for that person. Why? Because God is for that person. But think about this as well. So this man, he goes to the priest. He presents the necessary sacrifices. He goes through the ritual. And then the priest comes up to him. I mean, this guy's desperate, right? He's at his wit's end. And the priest comes up to him after this eight-day ritual, and he asks him this question. What happened to you? How did you get clean? You've had leprosy your whole life. What happened? And what would the man's answer be? I came into contact with Jesus. Jesus happened to me. And it would make his testimony and the priest's testimony an undeniable fact that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah who's come to establish the kingdom of God. But if you go on to read this passage of scripture, you'll see that the man didn't obey Jesus. He was so zealous, I'm not gonna lie, I probably would do the exact same thing if I had an incurable disease and I could never be married, never have kids, not hold a normal job, beg for my food, never worship God in the community, completely ostracized. I mean, if I get healed, I'm gonna shout it from the rooftops. But Jesus doesn't want him to do that because he's got a bigger purpose at hand. And so Jesus wanted to solidify and verify his ministry as the Messiah. And in order to do that, he's got to put these Pharisees in a very tight situation, an undeniable fact. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And so Jesus had to actually, the Bible says he withdrew and he went and he prayed and he fellowshiped with God because the crowd started to swarm him and come around him. There was something so special and so unique about this guy, Jesus. And I think that's what our people and our culture should see in us today. People should be attracted to the kind of message that we teach and we preach. People should find hope in a hopeless situation. And that's what's going on here. Now, Jesus wants to give this testimony. He wants to make this an airtight argument for his Messiahship because Jesus had this ongoing problem with the Pharisees. Let me give you a perfect example. The Pharisees hated Jesus. They were religious leaders who were more concerned about their traditions than the word of God. Remember, I shared with you, they would throw stones at them, wouldn't go into the market with them. Uh, They wanted them to be at least six feet away. If the wind blew, (laughs) if the wind blew, they had to be about 100 feet away. There was really no distance that could cover that kind of insecurity. I mean, these guys were black and white when it came to the law, and even more so. And they developed this reputation of neglecting the more important things of the law. And so in other words, they were good at coming to church. They were good at giving their tithe. They were good at reading their Bible every day, but they neglected the greater things in the law. Jesus told the Pharisees this in Matthew 23. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers and religious leaders of the law? You Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, but do not neglect the more important things. You know, something that I do, uh, I listen to John Maxwell uh, Leadership Podcast. It's really great. They just started it. John Maxwell, in my opinion, is the man, one of the greatest leaders that we have in our time, super bright guy, and something that he asks every time, As wealthy as he is, as influential as he is, as experienced as he is, he always asks this, what am I missing? What am I missing about this? And he asks the people around him, and it's whoever he's placed in that position. I think that's a really good question we should ask as we go about our Christian life. What am I missing? What's distracting me from neglecting or adhering to the greater things of the law? Am I doing the bare minimum 
Or am I being compassionate? Am I being gracious and kind? Am I exercising justice? The more important things. doesn't mean that the other things aren't important or necessary. It just means this. Am I living my life in such a way that I'm missing the heart of the gospel? Am I missing the heart of Jesus and the heart of God? That's where these, these Pharisees were in. And so let's, let's have three takeaways that we can bring to us this morning about this story. First of all, Jesus is available to you. He is available to you. Your sickness, your disease, your struggle is not outside of the realm of how God wants to bring healing into your life. The the only question is whether or not it will accomplish the greater purposes of God. And so some of you have been struggling with physical conditions and you'll never get rid of it because ultimately God sees the big picture and he sees that your suffering produces the greater glory. And that's what's true. So health and wealth is not promised in the gospel, but that doesn't mean God doesn't want you to be made whole. I can also guarantee you this, whatever secret sin that you're struggling with, whatever behind the scenes thing that's going on, God wants to bring you healing in that. He wants to restore you. That's the whole point of giving us his Holy Spirit to make us more holy and like him. And so God is for you overcoming whatever addiction or whatever sickness that you have spiritually. God is for you. He is available to you. As a Christian, this passage is written to us as Christians. For those of you who haven't obeyed the gospel, this promise isn't extended to you. But there are some times in my life with the decisions that I make, I question whether whether or not God can actually forgive me for certain things that I do. You ever been there? Will God really forgive me this? Because I've done it. 99,000 times, (laughs) you know what I mean. There's some things you just can't seem to get over. Here's a promise in 1 John 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Sinless perfectionism is a nasty disease that you can't cure because you're a liar. Verse 9, it says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and is just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And man, sometimes I don't feel like that's true, but yet I trust in the promise of God. He will forgive me if I confess it to him. So if there's something that you're struggling with this morning and you don't think you can receive forgiveness from God as a Christian, that isn't true. Don't be tricked. Trust in the promises of God. Secondly, healing is possible for you. And so while this man's leprosy was an exchange for healing, our sin was exchanged with Christ on the cross. We can find legal justification before God. We can be right according to the law, but also inner healing, restoration of our soul. That's the purpose and the point of being a Christian. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You were made whole by the cross, and that's good news. You can find healing through the cross, and that is great news if you're willing to accept it. And then thirdly and finally, while this man was commissioned to go and be a testimony to the priest at the temple, we are commanded to go and be a testimony to the lives around us. You know, certain religions teach that only certain kinds of people are priests, and you have to go to that person to get access an intercession between you and God. That's not what the Bible teaches. When you become a Christian, you enter the royal priesthood and you get instant access to God. You don't have to go through me. You don't have to go through anybody else. You can go right to God, right where he's at. And notice what happens with a person who goes to God for this kind of healing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, you, you Christians, are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Look at this, God's special possession. Even in the midst of my sin, even when I feel like I'm a failure, you're still God's royal special possession. And then notice this, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Man, that's awesome. What's your job What happens when you encounter this kind of Jesus? Well, first of all, trust in the promises that you're forgiven. Trust in the promises that you're forgiven. Second of all, understand that when you stand before God as you, messed up, broken, sinful, that you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. His cross was exchanged for your sin. 
And so you don't have to worry about not being on God's side. God is for you. And then thirdly, share it with the people around you. I like the idea of, hey man, me too. You struggle with that? You feel like you're a sinner? Me too. But here's what God can do with somebody like me. And here's what God can do with somebody like you. That's the promise of the gospel. Let's stand and let's pray.